Um, my name is, is Frank Roden. I'm working for BNP Paribas. I'm based in Luxembourg. What I want to cover today is uh, long-term trends and capital markets. But to think about long-term trends, I mean, it's difficult to see that far in the future. So I'm going to cover also a bit of a history of capital markets and banking in order to give you a sense of the evolution over time. But I do want to look ahead at what is shaping the industry. I think it'll be probably similar to some of the other themes that you're covering in, in these sessions, uh, which is good because uh, we should have some consistency in the way that we see the future. I don't know how many people are on the call or, or exactly what you're all studying. And therefore I'm assuming pretty much uh, zero knowledge. So maybe some of the things I cover on the history side you're familiar with, but let's, let's get started. Um, let's move straight into this topic because it's a massive industry. It's a huge infrastructure. You probably uh, think a lot about uh, potential roles in the future as fund managers and investment bankers and these type of things, but actually it's a massive industry and, and an infrastructure that supports all of that. So let's start to pull back the curtain on, on this topic. This picture is the orangery at three Rue d'Antin in Paris. So why do I show you this? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, a bit of historic uh, significance. This is, the, this is where Napoleon Bonaparte used to live, so in the 18th century. And in 1796, Napoleon and Josephine were married here. What it's perhaps less famous for is it's the head office of BNP Paribas Group. And in fact, the senior management team have been working here continuously for the last 150 years. Well, not the same people, obviously, but you get the point. BNP Paribas is a universal bank. What does that mean? So a universal bank is essentially a bank that carries out multiple activities. So you've got on the one hand, you've got commercial banking, and on the other hand, you've got investment banking. Commercial banking is, is really serving the retail and corporate customers, taking deposits and lending money. Investment bank is more linked with the capital markets, helping clients to access those markets to raise finance and to manage their risk and so on. And we're going to cover both of these activities in this session. But the bank does a lot more than just that. It's also carrying out asset management activities. It's carrying out vehicle leasing, a provision of insurance, and a wide range of activities which are in total financing the economy. And we'll come back to this because financing the econ economy is, is the core goal, the core objective, the core raison d'etre of the capital markets and the banking industry. So what do I do in all of that? Well, I work for BNP Paribas Security Services. Our business is helping institutional clients. So I'm talking about asset managers, insurance companies, pension funds, and sovereign, sovereign clients, so government funds, helping them to access capital markets. And we provide the full infrastructure that allows those clients to trade in global markets. So when they're buying and selling investments, we make sure that legal ownership of the investments changes hands and that the cash moves between the different parties. We also provide the clients bank accounts to safe keep their cash and their securities. And we provide them with a wide range of ancillary financing and administrative services. This topic about what banks do and what capital markets do is going to be a recurring theme in this presentation. And to give to try and put it into context, if you look at the if you look at the financial report of BNP Paribas for last year, you'll see that we had something like 33 billion euro of loans outstanding. So that means that the bank has made loans to its clients, including more than 120,000 state guaranteed loans during the, the COVID pandemic. But on top of that, we've actually helped our clients to raise almost 400 billion euro in financing from capital markets. And that's 10 times the amount that the bank is able to, to, to lend directly. So when you, when you think about banks and capital markets, and when we think about ourselves as a bank, helping clients get to capital markets means we can do much more as a bank than we could just acting on our own balance sheet by ourselves. So what I'm gonna do now is go into a little bit of the history of the banking industry and then the capital markets, and then we'll start to talk about some of the drivers. This is a little bit linked to the history of banking, as you might guess. But before we talk about this, which, which shows uh, some Italians in the 14th century, we're going to go a bit farther back because the history of banking is actually tied to the history of money. And as you might imagine, people have been very inventively using different types of money going back to 
10, 11,000 years. And, and that long ago, the type of money they were using were things that they could easily uh, transport and, and, and uh, transact in. So grain, tea, cattle, even, even if cattle are a bit less transportable than grain, arrowheads, precious metals and gemstones. But by 2000 BC, you had already the first glimmer of banking activities because merchants, there were merchants already who were giving grain loans to farmers and to traders who were carrying uh, goods between cities. And then later in ancient Greece and, and during Roman Empire and in China, you had lenders uh, who were giving loans while accepting deposits and performing the, the change of, of money. But it's really in the Middle Ages in Italy that these ancient practices have been taken up and you've seen the emergence of what we call merchant banks, which were, which were becoming more commonplace as the grain industry was developing. So the farming industry was developing. And we can find the origins of our current banking system today in the increasingly affluent cities in, in Italy, uh, affluent cities like Florence, Venice and Genoa. And in fact, the oldest bank, which is still in existence today is Bank uh, Monte de Paschi di Siena which is based in Siena in Italy, and they've been operating continuously since 1472. So you can imagine that having those banks having started with, with trading activity in Italy over the subsequent couple of hundred years, as people started explore, exploring globally and, and empires started growing, there was a lot more international trade happening over the subsequent couple of hundred years. And these type of merchant banks were helping to finance a lot of that growth in, in international activity. And in fact, the merchant banks themselves, you can recognize them in some of the banks that we see today. So for example, Berenberg Bank or Metzler Bank in Germany, or even a bit closer to home HSBC Bank, which, which started in Hong Kong, was very much started financing that type of international trade. BNP Paribas, by contrast, was formed through the merger of Banque Nationale de Paris and, and Paribas, and that merger happened in 2000. But actually, those two entities can be traced back to the 19th century. BNP Paribas' origins in, on the BNP side were in the aftermath of the 1848 French Revolution and the subsequent financial crisis. The bank was created by the French government to provide credit in support of the expansion in rail transport and the resulting industrial growth. Paribas, on the other hand, was originated in Amsterdam as a private bank. So actually what you can see is that the origins of these banks can be very, very different, but the rationale is typically the same. They're acting as a depository, so they're taking cash from people who need to deposit cash and other assets, and they're providing finance for commercial and investment activity. Now, it's probably an obvious thing to say, but when you deposit cash with the bank, in some form, it's going to be lent to someone else so banks are a bit like capital markets in the sense that they're helping the movement and the flow of capital from those who have it and who have a surplus to those who actually need that capital to invest. But let's take a look now at capital markets and how it differs a bit from banking. So this is a massive uh, stroke of irony because here you've got a picture of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange founded in the early 1600s. And if you looked at the, the FT headlines this morning, uh, you'll have seen that Amsterdam post-Brexit has just overtaken the London Stock Exchange in terms of volumes. So this, is, this, this Amsterdam Stock Exchange has long been uh, viewed as the origin of modern stock exchanges, stock exchanges that specialize in creating and sustaining sec secondary markets where people can trade. So the Dutch actually were the first to trade their shares at a regular stock exchange. And, and when you think about capital markets activity, capital markets is generally described as a financial market in which long-term debt over a year or, or other equity-backed securities are bought and sold. So the capital markets fulfill a similar role to banks, as I said, in that they channel the wealth of savers to those who can put it into long-term productive use, such as companies or governments making long-term investments. And a capital market can be either a primary market or a secondary market. So in a primary market, new stock or bond issues are sold directly by the company or by the government to investors. In the secondary markets, these are existing securities that are sold and bought among investors or traders, usually on an exchange, or it can be also over the counter or elsewhere. But if you think about the London Stock Exchange and the Amsterdam Exchange, these are typically secondary markets where, where, where securities are, are sold. 
The importance of secondary markets is the fact that it gives you as a primary investor. So if you invest in the primary market into some type of company or project, the existence of a secondary market gives you an option to sell that investment if you don't want to hold it to maturity. So the existence of secondary markets is actually very important in increasing the willingness of, of investors to invest into the primary markets. If you decide to invest money and buy shares in the London Stock Exchange via a broker, as I said, you're, you're pretty much certain to be dealing on the secondary market. But if you were to invest your money into a retail investment fund, you're probably going to be dealing on the primary market. So most funds issue their units directly to the investors and they buy the units directly back from the investors. So that's a primary market activity. There are some funds that are dealt with on the secondary market, but those are more exchange traded funds or UK investment trusts. So let's go back to those Italian city states. If you remember, they, they developed a lot of wealth from their grain activity, but they also needed to, to raise money when they were going to war. And they developed the first formal bond markets, but they didn't actually develop those secondary markets or formal capital markets. And that's why it was only done by the Dutch later on. And why did the Dutch develop those markets? Because they wanted to finance international trade. So it was the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company that issued shares so that people could invest in them and finance their activities in the markets that they were in. So th these capital markets that I've described, Amsterdam and London, these are what's known as public markets. And what's very interesting to know is actually who's, act who's investing in these markets, because as I said, you know, individuals can invest in public markets, um, but actually there are also institutions more and more present in these markets. And what you can see from this slide that the relative percentages of individual and institutional investors in the US equity markets over the last 50 years. And this is very, very important because what you see that here is the growth of institutional investment and it's institutional investors who are driving the evolution of capital markets activity. And we're going to come back to this a bit more in, in, later in the presentation. Now, at the end of 2017, the OECD calculated there were about 4,000 listed companies in the US worth about $40 trillion dollars. Globally, about 10 times as many companies, so 41,000 globally, worth about 84 trillion, so about twice the value of the US market. So what you can see is a huge amount of value in the US market, but proportionately many fewer companies. And this is also something we're gonna come back to in a minute because it's important to understand what's happening in, in, in those markets and how listed markets are evolving. About 90% of the market capitalization globally is represented by the largest 10,000 companies. And when the OECD looked at these companies, they found that over 40% of the ownership is in the hands of institutional investors. So these are mutual funds, pension funds, and insurance companies. And that's exactly consistent with what you see in this slide, because indeed the US market has evolved to about 40% institutional ownership of, of equities. But it's even higher when you look in some corners. And actually, if you look at, at companies like Apple and Alphabet and Microsoft and Facebook, what you'll find is that the institutional ownership is, in, is around the 80%. So it can be 80% or even higher. Now here, the, the balance that's not held by individuals and institutions is typically held by the public sector, some private companies, and perhaps some, some other wealthy individuals. Um, but that's, that's the public markets. What I want to focus on now is the private markets, because what you'll see is there's a strong growth trend in the private markets. They're much smaller than the public ones. Remember, I said the public markets are about $80 trillion. The, the private markets is difficult to get an exact figure, but they're probably around the, the US uh, dollar six trillion mark. So maybe, maybe eight to, to 10%, let's say, of the size of public markets but they're growing very significantly over the recent decades. Now, let's look at those private markets and, and in particular look at the private, let's look at the private equity firms because that's where a lot of the story is, uh, is evolving. If you want some nice graphical views of economic and financial data, then I can recommend that you look at the Visual Capitalist website if you don't already use it. Here you can see the largest private equity firms 
And we're going to take a bit of a look now at how these entities have come into existence because it's really a story about the latter half of the 20th century, but it's a story that's continuing to evolve very quickly. And of course, investment in, in private markets, in private companies, it's not a new story, right? Because investors have been acquiring businesses and making investments in privately held companies since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the merchant banks that we looked at earlier were, were also financing commercial ventures, um, but this activity was curtailed by banking regulation in the US in the 1930s, notably the Glass-Steagall Act. So actually what you found, because if, if you look at where private equity companies, private equity businesses have been based historically, they've grown very much in the US. And it's this change in regulation with the Glass-Steagall Act that has excluded banks from financing this activity. And that meant that the early days of private equity, at least in the US, were mainly the domain of wealthy individuals. And the first venture capital firms in this industry were launched after World War II. And why that was, was private investment uh, into businesses which were being set up by soldiers returning from the war. So here, just stop and, and make a couple of points because you find the emergence of this private equity industry, number one, is designed to channel capital in, in the US markets to where it's needed, i.e. surplus capital being used by returning soldiers to set up businesses. Secondly, the way that the private equity business is, is, is arisen and the way that this capital markets activity has arisen has been driven by public, uh, public policy. So the banks have been excluded from this activity and therefore other firms and individuals have moved into it. So after World War II, the, the industry, I would say, remained relatively niche for the next 30 years or so. And even if there were some buyout transactions happening during that early period, it was more venture capital startup businesses after World War II. But then along came Bear Stearns and KKR. So Kohlberg, Kravis Roberts, and these individuals were actually working for Bear Stearns originally. And then they set up their own, uh, their own private equity business. So it's the first real private equity uh, company that was set up post-war. And why were they set up? They were set up to, to take advantage of the buyout opportunities because all of those returning soldiers who came back from World War II, they, they wanted to retire. So they wanted to exit the businesses, but they didn't have any succession planning and they didn't want to, they want, didn't want to sell to a competition. So they, they started to sell to, to buyout companies like KKR. And there were also firms that, such as Thomas H. Lee that were really focusing on management and leverage buyouts of mature companies during this period. Actually, KKR, you can see on this slide, is, is one of the biggest private equity groups still. Thomas Lee is not in the, the, the top 25 on this basis, but they're still around. And then in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a boom in this leverage buyout market driven by tax arbitrage and other incentives and less availability of institutional cash due to restrictions on investment by pension funds into private markets. So again, you see public policy driving the way that the capital markets are evolving. And this is an important thing to remember again for, for, the, for the future um, of the presentation. So as we saw earlier, it's institutional investors that became the dominant forces in public markets over time. And this is now happening in private markets. And to understand why we need to look at investment returns. So what is this? This is my very sophisticated pension planning for myself. So let's, let's assume that uh, I'm gonna retire at 65. And I'm going to live until the mean age of the UK, which is uh, 81. The question is, how much money do I need to be able to uh, fund my retirement, assuming that I want an income of 30,000 a year? And when I pass away at the age of 81, I'm happy to have spent all my money. Well, what this tells me is that if I'm going to invest my money into uh, government bonds, into UK government bonds, which is the blue line, I need about 460,000 Pounds. So I need a, a £460,000 pension pot. I'm going to invest it in government, UK government bonds, and then I'm going to sell that portfolio down over time, and that'll give me enough money, 30000 a year, uh, until I pass away at the age of 81. What happens if I get to 65 and I don't have 460000 Let's say I just have 400000 Well, I can either keep working and, and earn more money, or I can choose to invest with a different strategy. 
I can choose to try and get a, an investment return of 3%. And as you see, if I get, if my pension pot is closer to 300,000, I'm going to need a, a return of almost 5% to be able to fund, to be able to fund uh, my, my retirement. So what you see is that the, the 0.5% is, is the risk-free rate, which you, which you can get from investing in government bonds because government bonds are a pretty safe investment. But if I need to generate 3% or 5%, the difference above that 0.5% is called the risk premium. And I, and I need to look at other investments that are gonna give me those returns, knowing that I need to take on more risk. Now, this is what it looks like, not in my simplistic example, but in the real world. This is the, this is the activity of a, of a pension fund. And the pension fund here is the CalPERS pension fund. It's the California Public Employees Retirement Scheme. And if you look at the more or less horizontal line, this is the pension fund's assumed rate of return. You'll see it's hovering around 8% between 1980 and, and 2020. This is the return that the pension fund needs to meet the payments to its pensioners. If the pension fund's unable to meet this return, it's got three choices pretty much. It can, it can ask companies or employers, employees to increase contribution to the fund. It can reduce the payments to the pensioners or it can look for alternative investments to get a better return. And obviously one and two are pretty unacceptable. So most pension funds are looking for uh, improvement in, in their returns. And what you can see from CalPERS is that up until the sort of late 1980s, 1990s, the assumed return was actually below what they could get by investing in US 10 and 30 year bonds. But what you can see since then is that with interest rates falling and, and the interest and the return on government bonds falling, they have to find this additional risk premium. And today they, they need to find an additional uh, sort of five, six percent in order to be able to, to generate the return they need for the, for, the, for the pensioners. So they're gonna start looking at different asset classes. What does this look like? So here you've got a mapping of asset classes. On the left-hand side, you can see annual return and percentage. Now remember, they need to get a sort of additional uh, five, six percent at least and then as you, as you look along the horizontal graph, you can see the standard deviation. So how much does the return deviate from the mean? I.e., that's a measure of the risk. And if you look at it, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? If you look at where venture capital and buyout funds, i.e. private equity type investments, you can see that they're immediately going to look more attractive to these type of institutional investors. But of course, you can see they've also got a, a larger uh, standard deviation. So you have to take on more risk in order to be able to get a better return. Now we need to interpret this cautiously as because on private markets and in private equity, there's not as much information available as there is in public markets. And of course, if, if you have private uh, equity investments that are unsuccessful and the firms have gone bust, they're probably no longer going to be around in order to feed the statistics. So by definition, you might expect to be only seeing statistics from more successful businesses. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we can see that for institutional investors, they've got a real, they've got a real incentive to look at these asset classes, both in public markets and private markets, um, but especially on the private market side. And this is, a, this, is, this is what we're going to look at next, uh, how that's evolving over time. So here again, still looking at the US, US pensions and endowments and how they've been shifting out of cash and fixed income over the recent decades. And as I said, because there are lower returns on, on uh, treasury bonds, on government bonds, they need to find more return from the public markets and from alternative assets. And for alternative assets here, you can think hedge funds, uh, and private equity, private capital funds. So what you can see is that actually the, the allocation has been moving from fixed income into both public markets and private markets. And, and in fact, there are plenty of other statistics that back this up. Uh, I think JP Morgan, if in the five years to 2019, JP Morgan estimated that worldwide, the, the allocation of assets into unlisted real estate, hedge fund assets and private capital, private equity, private debt has increased by about 44%. But the other interesting thing is that in the last six years, some of those biggest 
private equity companies, so I'm talking about Apollo, Blackstone, Carlyle, and KKR, their total managed assets have almost doubled to $1.4 trillion. And that, that is very, very impressive growth. So one thing that might jump out on this, uh, on this slide is what's happening between private and public markets. So let's take a little bit of a look at, at public markets and private markets, how we differentiate them and what's happening. So in the public markets, company sell shares to the, the general, essentially to the general, the, the general public. Uh, but the general public are typically investing, as we can see, through institutions like mutual funds, insurance companies, and pension funds. But when you, you invest in, in those markets, you're typically taking a share in a public company. And a public company is very heavily regulated. So they, 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 they've got a lot of accountability to shareholders. So they have a lot of disclosure requirements they have to disclose information about their performance so you can see their financials uh, and their uh, how their revenues are evolving and so on so the characteristics of public markets are that investors can invest in those markets either directly or indirectly the companies that raise finance in this way are known as public companies that are heavily regulated they have to report on performance on a regular basis and it's generally therefore very easy to find out information about them by contrast fast growing companies that are not publicly traded can still raise finance, uh, but they, they're going to go to the private markets. And those type of investors are, are more venture capital firms, private equity firms, and other institutions. And with some exceptions, wealthy individuals, general public cannot really invest into that space. And because, because of that, the, the key characteristics of private markets are really, it's limited to professional investors, it, they're very less regulated and there's very little disclosure that they have to do. They don't have to report on performance and it's very hard to find information about them. But nevertheless, we still see that institutional businesses are going in very quickly. And, and in fact, the private markets are growing more quickly than public ones. Why is that? Well, the public markets, the value is increasing. Here again, we're still looking at the US. So the value of the US stock markets is increasing, but actually the number of companies in the US number of listed companies is only about 50% of what it was in the 1990s. And you, on the other hand, as the, as the institutional investors are going into private markets, they're, they're looking for private investments. And in fact, because of the, the greater risk of private markets, it's important when you go into those markets, because there's very little information available, that you can actually uh, have someone advising you. So this is where private equity firms come in. And the, and the largest in, institutions who are investing into those markets can afford to pay money to hire the best private equity firms and to search out the best returns and therefore to minimize the risk that they're taking when they go into those markets. Now, you would imagine that as more and more institutional investors go into private markets, the, 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 the opportunities would quickly become limited. And that is a bit the case, but on the other hand, there are still more companies that are going to those private markets to, 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 to get financing. And that's one of the reasons why you see the public, the public uh, listed companies on the decline, because they're rather going through mergers and there are very few companies coming to the public markets to replace that stock. Why is that? Why, why are so few companies coming to public markets? Well, actually what's happening is that the small number of public companies are becoming huge. And typically you're going to go to, to public markets if you need to raise a lot of capital. Whereas for new emerging companies, the amount of capital needed is actually not, not always that significant. And one of the reasons that's happening is because there's an increase in the intangible assets that companies are investing in where you actually need much less capital. So think about it as physical books. So if I'm a, if I'm a company that is producing physical books, I need a printing plant, I need a distribution chain to deliver those books to the end readers. And unless the book's going to a library or some other public resource, each reader is typically requiring the production of one physical book with all the raw resources that that's needed, that that's needed to support that. But if you compare that to digital technology, where a digital edition of a book can be delivered instantaneously and read simultaneously by many people, what you can see is the, the infrastructure for that, once you've invested in it, is very, very scalable. So companies that are producing intangible assets, they need much less capital because they need fewer physical assets. 
And this allows them to raise capital from the private markets and actually to remain private for much longer. So the, these trends are continuing, but we're going to stop there with the capital markets for a moment. And we're going to switch the focus from the EU uh, back to sorry to the, back to the banking industry and to the EU because I want to talk a little bit about what's happening historically in the banking industry and how that's impacting capital markets as we look forward in Europe. So this graph shows the bank lending in the eurozone before and after the global financial crisis of 2008 GFC, and what you can see is that bank lending has dropped dramatically and has not really has not really reached the pre-crisis levels despite GDP largely recovering. And it's important here to, to, to have a quick comparison between bank loans and, and capital markets to understand um, the differences and the similarities. So there are some similarities, but there are differences because bank loans are not securitized. So they don't take the form of a resaleable security. Lending from banks is very heavily regulated. And the people who are investing in banks, i.e. depositors, people like you and me, we tend to be more risk averse than people who are investing in the capital markets. So what that means is that the, the, this is limiting institutional lending as, as a source of finance in those markets. But on the other hand, there's some differences that favor lending by banks. They're generally more accessible for small and medium-sized companies, and, and they have the ability to create money as they lend. And in fact, historically in the 20th century, most company finance, apart from share issues, was raised by bank loans. But since about 1980, there's been an ongoing trend for disintermediation where large and credit worthy companies have found that they can effectively pay out less interest if they borrow directly from capital markets rather than banks. And this has been really pronounced since the 2008 global financial crisis, and it's been very pronounced in the US. But compared to that in, the, in Europe and despite the, the GFC, the financial crisis, European Union companies have maintained a greater reliance on bank lending for funding. And there's a number of reasons for that. It's, it's partly a more favorable tax treatment of lending via banks. It's also the fact that uh, SMEs, so small and medium sized companies, otherwise have difficulty accessing capital markets in Europe, which are not as integrated or as evol evolved as US ones. And saving patterns, European savers are generally prefer easy access to their investments. So, so the money tends to go into banking deposits and short-term assets rather than into uh, capital markets and, and, and shares and bonds, where US investors have been more comfortable with long-term investing for longer. And actually in the EU, most capital markets activity remains in domestic markets. And so European financial integration remains very limited. But what you'll see is that in, from an EU perspective, these recent financial and political shocks have accelerated the need to tackle this lack of integration. And what we want to look at now is the public policy in the EU, because it's going to help me to signpost the trends that are going to evolve over the next few years. And why is it useful to look at public policy? Well, throughout this presentation, what you could see is that the evolution of banking and capital markets has been driven by the need to fund commercial or investment activity, and more recently by the need for a return on savings. So on the other hand, now the, the banking and capital markets activity has evolved, has been very much being influenced by public policy and resulting regulation. So let's take a look at what is accelerating the pace of change and how public policy is, is evolving, at least in the EU. I mean, the UK will be similar, but the EU is probably uh, better documented at this stage. What you've got here are the high level objectives of, of the EU in terms of the Capital Markets Union, the CMU. And if we look at the drivers for this, the global financial crisis had two main consequences on financial integration in the EU. So first of all, it highlighted the instability by an excessive reliance on bank loans, uncertainty in the economy and heightened counterparty risk. And this, this pressure also led to, also impacted cross-border investments so it lessened cross-border investments and further drove down, further increased the bias on domestic market activity and reinforced fragmentation across the EU. And then all this helped to bring about the EU banking union, which brought in new rules on capital requirements, deposit guarantees, and a mechanism to deal with recovering, uh, recovery and resolution of banks. 
So this done a lot for the EU banking system, but, it's, but actually it also placed limitations on the capacity of EU banks to continue financing European markets. So that's why banks are lending less into the EU economy than they were doing previously, because they have a lot more constraints on, on the capital requirements. And it's therefore much more important to integrate capital markets across Europe. That's why the EU is now accelerating the capital markets unit. So it's designed to help small, medium-sized entities, other firms and companies to access the capital markets. It's designed to reduce the dependency on the banking system, provide more diverse range of financing, make the economy more shock resistant and improve the efficiency of the capital markets generally, especially on a cross-border basis. And if you look at COVID and how this is framing public policy, we can, we can see that this further accelerates the need for a more effective capital markets infrastructure. And it's directly linked with the green agenda and with the digital economy. And I'm going to cover those two points now before we conclude. So on, on this slide, you'll see uh, the European Green Deal. So in September of last year, the European Commission published its policy on investing in a climate neutral future. I'm not going to get into uh, the rationale for, for, uh, for this at this stage in terms of climate change. That's well documented. But let's focus on the numbers. So according to the EU in 2019, EU emissions were down by about 25% compared to 1990. Nevertheless, the economy grew by over 60% during that period. Okay, that's a bit simplistic, but what it tells you is that you can have confidence that it's possible to tackle climate change while growing the economy. The problem is, is that the current policy is insufficient to meet the commitments under the, the Paris Agreement. And so a change of policy is needed at EU level uh, if we're going to attain climate neutrality by 2050 and to, uh, to achieve a reduction in, in emissions of 55% by in, in the next 10 years. So this means a lot of investment uh, through, for example, through construction of wind turbines, cleaning up legacy industries, renovating buildings to make them more energy and resource efficient. And it's a strong incentive to help EU businesses position themselves as leading in this development in order to also help build the, the economy in, this, in, in, in the next uh, low carbon uh, version of that economy. And rising to those, to those channels, challenges means enormous investment. The EU estimates that between 2021, i.e. right now, and 2030, we need to spend an additional 350 billion of energy-related investment annually. There is no way that public funds will be sufficient to meet that investment need. And that's why it's critical that the Sustainable Finance Initiative helps to guide private investment towards this green recovery. So this is a very strong driver behind the capital markets union in the EU. And we should expect to see more in this area over the coming weeks and months. Let's look also at the digital finance strategy because this is also extremely important in this context. Um, so as I mentioned above, the, the investment into intangible assets such as digital technology can lead to strong, can really bring a strong multiplier in terms of economic benefits for uh, consequentially lower uh, investment up front. Data is becoming a really key asset. Uh, you probably have heard that in other sessions. In the past, we used to keep client assets in bomb-proof vaults. Today, we have cyber-secure data vaults to hold digital records of our clients' assets. So this digital finance strategy for Europe is really, really important. The EU has set out four priorities in this context. Tackling cross-border fragmentation. So you heard about that already on the capital markets union, but, but digital tools can, can help with that. Development of regulatory frameworks to support digital assets and technology, such as distributed ledger technology and blockchain. Creation of a European financial data environment to facilitate availability of financial and other data on companies and projects. Remember that I said getting data on private markets is very difficult. So this data topic is, is extremely important. And addressing new challenges and risks associated with digital transformation to ensure that we safeguard the markets and the consumers. Because as, as you can imagine, with new technology comes new risk. So digital strategy goes hand in hand with the Green Initiative. And, and the three things together are really supporting the, the Capital Markets Union Initiative. So this is, this is where I want to finish and to try and give you, I mean, summarize where we're heading in the future and, and why it's, uh, what you should think about in terms of 
roles for the future of potential jobs and, and, and where to focus. So expect public policy to drive investment in the transition to a low carbon future and to a more digitalized economy. Having an interest in sustainability and digital technology is absolutely key, it's fundamental. If you don't know what ESG means, you need to find out as soon as possible. On technology, I would say, especially data right now. And actually, the data topic is extremely important for private markets, but it's also absolutely critical for ESG. So data science is the absolute number one priority in terms of technology. In the future, we'll see more priorities on efficient robotic processes. Uh, I'm talking about digital processes, not, not uh, robots and car factories. And longer term, uh, DLT, so distributed ledger technology and blockchain. So the first digital assets are coming out in countries like Germany, but this will be a much more long-term long development. Remember that the financing of all of this does not come from governments alone. Investments from the private sector are key. So as the sector grows, you'll see the same needs coming through on the private, on private capital markets, incorporation of ESG and better access to digital technology, including data and analytics, including ESG. And all of this requires a huge access to talent and also, by the way, a driver for diversity and inclusion. So that's your opportunity. That's the challenge. I'm very happy to stop there and, and, take, and take some questions. Thank you very much for Rodan to share your thoughts with us. I have a slide which can show all the questions. Just give me a minute. As of the first question, do you think there is a high likelihood that London's leading position in capital markets will be taken over by other European cities such as Amsterdam or Paris? Or will initiatives such as overhauling the rules for company listings to attract growth companies will help the UK maintain its position? Yeah, interesting. It harks back to what we saw in the FT and, and what I mentioned earlier. I think don't, don't be tra trading volumes on stock exchange is, is stock exchange is one thing, but trading volumes on stock exchange uh, brings headlines, but itself is not bringing a lot of let's say a lot of value and the margins are, are very thin on that. So it's a way for exchanges to capture headlines. What's more important is how those markets are actually supporting the, the movement of capital and long-term investments. And I think the UK and, and the London Stock Exchange and actually London, the city of London, because one of the things the EU is concerned about is the concentration of financial expertise in London, which is not the case for other cities in the EU. So I think London, London will still have a very important role to play. And by the way, it's, it's much more important to be integrated and, and, and doing things together than, than working on silos. So the fact that London remains as a bit of competition in a near European time zone, I think is a good thing for, for everybody. It'll make things in the EU probably happen faster. Um, overhauling rules for company listings. Like I said before, I think the growth companies you should watch out for more of the private markets rather than the public ones. I think the public markets are there for companies that need to raise very significant amounts of finance. Thanks. Second question. How, uh, for the long-term trends in investments, do the private equity hedge in their funds if market goes into short squeeze and different companies come out with the different strategies to make profit in the market, right? If the market turns around. Whoa, that's a uh, that's good question. So I think um, the, I would say, let's take a jump to the side for a second and talk about hedge funds. I mean, hedge funds, when they first evolved at an advantage over most other investors because they were able to short the markets um, and give them an advantage, give them an arbitrage opportunity uh, over other investors. Now that, that's been partially, let's say partially dealt with. But I think on, on the private equity side, it's you're not really looking for so much of a hedge, I would say, because actually the, the private equity itself, let's say the term, the term hedge it has got much more to do with diversification. So private equity asset classes are a part of, a part of that diversification strategy, and they're, they're part of seeking um, an additional return and trying to reduce the level of correlation you have if the market does, you know, let's say, let's say if the, if the market uh, 
is the, the public markets are heading south. Um, it's part of a diversification strategy. And private equity is definitely, and it's a long-term investment. So, so you, you make it with different time horizons. And actually, when you look at, when you talk about market in a short squeeze versus private equity, you're talking about two different time frames typically, because you've got traders who are trading on a day-to-day -day basis, but you've got private equity who's investing for a long term. That's why the institutions are much more interested in those private equity type of investments, because they're thinking in terms of decades and not in terms of days or weeks. Thanks. What's your opinion like things that are going on Wall Street between Reddit retailers trader and the hedge fund management? What is the implications for the investment markets? That's tricky. Um, I, I think normally I would say that I think that the regulator has a role to play in this um, because on the face of it, it, it looks a bit like market manipulation. And I mean, and certainly there are some instances of uh, trading activity that, that could be caught. I mean, if you were, if you were trading on a day trader, on a day trading basis, and you were, um, let's say, flooding the market with orders and then taking them out again, I mean, it'd be a pretty obvious example of, of manipulating the market. The problem here is it's not so easy to prove that here because of the way these, let's say, chat facilities or social media works. And I think the regulations typically, and we've seen it in other walks of life, with Facebook and Twitter and uh, WhatsApp and so on, that regulations are not always evolving as quickly as the social media is evolving. So for sure, this is a problem. It, it could become a problem because it's, it's, acting, to, it's acting to make markets um, function uh, in bizarre ways where people are going to lose money. And that frankly is a problem. It needs to be dealt with. How it's going to be dealt with, I think it's a little bit early to, to say. Okay. And fourth question, with the massive stimulus packages across the developed world and supply bottlenecks appearing across industries, many are predicting the return of inflation. Do you think that it's likely that interest rates will begin to rise? And if so, what implications will that have for capital markets? Will that impact the rise of alternative investments? Yeah. Um, th this is a difficult question. I, I know that plenty uh, of the students are studying finance and economics, and, and I'm not uh, by training an economist, and, and uh, it would be dangerous for me to try and pre pretend that I can predict the future. Um, honestly, I, I don't think anyone really knows at this stage. Of course, I think what you're, the, the question is raising uh, a topic that, that's probably quite well documented in the, in the media. Um, it's true to say that we don't see interest rates beginning to rise in the near term, but frankly speaking, where everybody is in a is in a, is in the same situation, it's very difficult to predict the future. Uh, and as you can see with those supply chain squeeze, these are things that were not predicted by by anyone. If interest rates do begin to rise, then um, I think we we need to. Uh, we need to think much more about the long-term value and the investments that we're making. And I go back to the previous couple of questions. We need to disassociate the, the short-term value and the way markets are fluctuating on a day-to-day -day basis versus making good bets where there is long-term value. And by the way, you know, if you look at the, at the Green Deal and, and the way that we, we want to, I mean, public policy wants to shift investments into a low carbon economy, that's where we should be looking because on, on, on balance, that's where the value should come in the future, the economic value of, of building the infrastructure that's gonna support a low carbon economy. Now we're going to find risks in there because you don't have to look too far to see companies that have come into the, uh, in Europe in the production of solar panels. I think Solar World in Germany is one where they've already gone bust because the, the financial incentives dried up and they couldn't compete globally with, with other suppliers. But so there, there is a risk of investing into even to those low carbon economy opportunities, but it, it, that, that's where we need to look for the value in the future. So think about, uh, think about uh, the environment, think about sustainability and, and think about companies that have got the right social uh, policies and the ones that have got the right governance, ESG. And, and you've got a better chance I think of finding good economic growth opportunities, even if we get into a high inflation environment. Thanks. And uh, this question, would you see a loosening of regu regulatory restrictions on pension funds? 
and other regulated financial institutions to allow them to allocate the greater proportion of their portfolios to PE and VC. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it like that. I mean, I think I think to to an extent that that's also already partially happened. I think I think yes, if 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 let's say if we find that the, if, if, if the EU, for example, finds that there's, there's, there's insufficient institutional money going quickly enough into into those in, uh, type of investments, they may look at some, how to, what type of stimulus or incentive might be required. But I think more what's happening is in, in the opposite direction, where actually the, the, the EU is focusing on uh, actually requiring disclosures for companies on their impact on ESG topics and the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, and actually using those to incentivize investors or, or let's say to stimulate investors to think about where they're putting their, their capital. So too early to say that we need a loosening of regulatory restrictions. The regulations at the moment are more focusing on, on, on stimulating the, the disclosure of ESG type information to, to, to encourage that type of investment. Thanks. How can the shift from bank lending, which has been limited at least in the UK to SMEs post GFC, to capital market lending to include up as SMEs? Yeah, that's exactly what I what I was talking about on the, on the capital markets union. It's a key question. This is why sometimes things are happening a bit slower than we anticipate. Um, the, the the capital markets union is designed to address this point. If you if you look at the, what the, 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 the European uh, EU and the European Commission have published back in September, they've got quite a detailed action plan uh, to, to try and support this. But that, that is public policy. I mean, this, we have to make this happen. But in the meantime, as you can see, probably through the, the, the pandemic, banks like BNP Paribas continue to, uh, to uh, support, let's say, lending into the economy. And, and actually, somewhere behind that, then you have the governments uh, which are helping to support that lending program and to underwrite it to some, at least to some extent. So you can see that that public policy is still facilitating a bank lending route until we can get those capital markets union uh, activities more more developed. So it's it's a it's a very good question, but it's uh, it's we're into that uh, we're, we're into answering that question over the next few years. I think. Thanks. And the last question, what are some books recommendation, recommendations for novices? And there's also a question that I not included, which is a recommendation for sustainable investing books. Ah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, actually, I, 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 stopped, uh, I, I stopped reading some books because I find that sometimes that by the time I, I got to them, they were almost out of date, especially in the last sort of 12, 18 months. The world is moving very, very quickly. But I typically uh, will stay up to date with what the recommendations are coming through the FT. But actually, it's it's the internet is the best source of information. And actually, there are plenty of documents. When you look on the, the EU's websites and in terms of how the policy is evolving, that's a good place to start. The other places I would look at, if you want to look at how the investment industry is working in the UK and evolving, I would look at the investment association. The Investment Association is representing the UK investment management industry, which is about 8 trillion sterling under management. And we also have a, um, what's called the IA engine, which is promoting fintech, ex fintech uh, acceleration. So if you want to see what, how, public, how policy is being evolved in the industry, have a look at the Investment Association website in the UK and have a look at what we're doing there on the fintech side. It's, uh, there's some really good stuff happening. Thanks. Um, that basically sums up for, sums up for, uh, for today. And thank you very much for uh, Frank Roden to share your thoughts with us. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure indeed. And uh, tomorrow we have, uh, sorry, I need a ending slide. So, Tomorrow we have, uh, next week, we have investment opportunities being presented in the post-COVID world and taxation post-COVID area. So you can just register via this QR code here to receive email notification prior to all the events. Thank you again for attending today's sessions and thank you again for Frank Redding to share your thoughts with us. It's been a pleasure. Bye.